post good newspapers with good active local management don't fail. I don't think there's any city in the world that can afford two first class newspapers. In the big cities, some of the newspapers that uh, uh, have died in recent years, uh, I think couldn't have been saved. Uh, there will probably be more, more uh, fatalities in the future. The Buffalo Courier Express, the Cleveland Press, the Philadelphia Bulletin, the Washington Star, all of the memories now, recent victims of a changing society. The Courier's roots were planted in 1834, and Mark Twain was once the paper's editor. But the Star, Bulletin, and Press also shared long years of success and power. Why did they fail? What responsibilities fall to a community's surviving paper? What happens in the community when a paper prints a final edition? The Buffalo Courier Express will cease publication with its Sunday edition of September 19, unless a buyer is found who will continue publication of the morning and Sunday paper. We make this announcement, needless to say, with great regret. Despite our commitment of very considerable resources, and while we initially made some progress at reducing our rate of loss, our pre-tax losses over the past 35 months have averaged at an annual rate of about $8.6 million as we competed with the Buffalo Evening News on Sunday as well as weekdays. In almost every city where two papers still exist under separate ownership, there's a battle for survival. The Courier, a morning paper, was matched against the Buffalo News, a long-established afternoon publication with a commanding three-to-one edge in newspaper sales. Both papers were once owned by families of wealth and influence in the Buffalo area, but were sold in the 70s, leaving out-of-town owners to continue the fight for supremacy. The Courier's financial base and big payday was always its Sunday edition, until the news came out with its own Sunday paper. Reporter Fran Luca and news editor Murray Light. Many feel that the uh, weekend morning editions of the news uh, brought the Courier to its knees. I would look at it another way, that we knew that if we did not come out with a Sunday newspaper, that our existence as a newspaper in the long run very definitely was threatened. All we had to do was look at trends, you know, what had happened in other cities, and see the trends of advertising in newspapers, which was going more and more to preprints. You know how you open your sun, a good, healthy Sunday paper, and you shake out, and what falls out, all of these preprints. They all go into Sundays. We knew if we didn't enter Sunday, ultimately, it was going to be our death. We knew we had to do it. It was a survival move then. Oh, without any question. What is your reaction to the death of this newspaper? I just feel awful about it, just like losing our best friend. I don't think it's very good. I think we need the competition for the city. It's uh, obviously a step backwards for this great city like Buffalo. Uh, I, I understand that both sides have to give and take in situations like this. I really don't, don't, don't like to see this paper close. As a paper I buy every morning. I enjoy it. I think, I think it's a great part of Buffalo. It shouldn't have been let go. I read The Courier every morning and I was just very disappointed. I'm not thrilled about having just a one paper in the city now. I've always liked the two opinions and now I'm not sure what's going to happen. With time running out, a potential buyer was found for the courier, one who would pay nothing for the paper's assets but assume most of its debts. The deal would ultimately stand or fall on cuts in personnel and overhead. This is a much happier day than uh, the one we had last Tuesday. I'm delighted to announce the conditional sale of the Buffalo Courier Express by Coles Media Company to News America Publishing Incorporated. The sale depends upon a substantial reduction in annual payroll having been negotiated between News America and the Courier Express's unions by Thursday, September 16. Doing this would save jobs for about 700 of the present 1,100 employees. It's important that operating costs be dramatically reduced 
through agreement with the Courier Express unions. This will require a substantial reduction in force and considerable sacrifice on the part of the newspaper's employees. Uh, these are the things that would have to be done if we were willing to take on this task and to take the business risk inherent. And if the unions uh, are unwilling to do this, uh, fine, we will go back to New York. We have many other papers around the world and in this country. We don't feel in any way that we want to put pressure on the unions. We believe that they would like an opportunity to discuss with us what our conditions would be in order to save this paper and save a majority of their jobs. Originally, they uh, said they would need around seven and a half million dollars in concessions. Uh, the Newspaper Guild alone was offering uh, two million dollars to them, and there were eight other unions uh, with concessions, and we were confident we could have came up with uh, seven and a half million dollars in concessions to keep the courier going. The issue that uh, broke this thing up in the end was had nothing to do with cost. Who, you know, if they wanted to reduce the size of the newsroom from 157 or 156, whatever we have now to 90. I think we might have been able to agree to that, provided those persons were, were to be laid off in a, uh, the usual manner, that is to say, volunteers first, and then, if there weren't enough volunteers, by seniority starting at the bottom. I think we could have made that agreement with them. The proposal was, uh, frankly, one that was uh, repugnant to us in terms of principle. And that, uh, that is that they wanted to choose uh, who among the 156 people at the Courier Express in the newsroom uh, would be hired, who would be fired in the, uh, in the months and days and months following uh, uh, prospective takeover by News America, Rupert Murdoch's firm. shocked me. No, I hadn't expected. Uh, recently they've been telling us that there were a lot of moves being made to stabilize the economic situation here and uh, it caught everybody off of guard. We were completely unaware. I have five children at home so naturally at the age of 41 it's, uh, it's an awakening. Uh, none of the skilled trades received severance. Unfortunately it wasn't in our contract. Consequently, uh, outside of accumulated vacation credits, etc., there is no severance pay. Uh, we're basically on our own financially. What's new, Harry? <laughs> How about that? Something's, uh, what's new is something that doesn't hit the spot, I tell you, really. It's, uh, it's just a sad situation when uh, that many people are thrown out of work and when they voice of the communities has been silenced like that. 700 jobs could have been rescued. Uh, I know that they scream about the seniority bit, and I, I certainly am a senior member. I'm a senior member of the, of, of the editorial staff of the Courier Express who wanted this paper to survive and become a Murdoch product. The Courier was dead. It wasn't a case of a guy just buying a paper. The Courier was a dead issue. They were out of business. And the concession to pick and choose, I don't think is, is, uh, is not an outrageous uh, a demand. Certainly, he'd had a, he had to do it differently. If he did it the same, he'd be an $8 million loser, too. I think in the, in the end, the decision uh, in which our local union leadership decided that, number one, uh, uh, we, they did not want to destroy the, the time-honored uh, thing of seniority which Mr. Murdoch apparently was, was uh, Mr. Murdoch, as you know, wanted to hire and fire at will, notwithstanding seniority. I think seniority is a basic uni union tenant. If you have to fall on, a, on one tenant, I, I would say seniority would be a, uh, an important one to, to fall on. What do you feel was the predominant factor that killed off the courier? The new simply, uh, uh, outgutted us uh, in the trenches uh, in, in, this, in this first war. Uh, um, their, uh, their parent company, Blue Chip Stamps, apparently was uh, had a mind fix. They were apparently prepared to lose more money over the longer run than, than the, pe the folks who, who purchased us a few years back. We stopped, in my view, covering to the degree that we had news. I view 
Maybe it's old-fashioned, Fran, but I view a newspaper as just that, a news paper. I wanted the news to be there, in addition to the features and the sports and all the rest. I thought we were doing less of the news, a lot more of the features, and uh, I thought the sports and the features were growing in our paper. But I, I did not think the news was growing, and I didn't think the local impact was there. I thought that was a big part of it. Uh, so uh, I thought that was very important. Courier Express editorial writer Joseph Zelnick had two newspapers fold under him in the same year. He worked for the Philadelphia Bulletin when it failed in January 1982, and he had worked at the Courier Express only five months when it became an economic casualty in September. Now at the Bulletin, they came, uh, oh, it was in July or August before we went, we went out of business in January of this year. Preceding July or August, the Bulletin went to its unions and asked them to take cuts to stay in business. And the Bulletin unions, and it was eight or nine unions, they voted to accept those cuts, and we stayed in business. If, if calls had come to the Courier Express people, and to employees, and said, will you take some cuts, or else we're going to have to close, I'm just sure they would have taken the cuts. I mean, I can't imagine they wouldn't have. And I don't know why they, did, they didn't, they never tried that. They just announced, you know, they did it really fast. We're here for the long run, they said. We had always received that assurance. Uh, a week or two weeks before uh, the, uh, the announcement was made, we had just ratified a new contract during long negotiations. They never told us that the end was near. They didn't ask us to take zero wage increases. They offered us a raise. We took it. If they were going to do this, I suppose they should have offered more in retrospect, but there was no indication that this was coming uh, right up to the end. Obviously, I, had, I would, would have hoped that they would have stayed here longer and, and, and fought it out, but uh, they, they have a board of directors to answer to, and the, and the numbers here uh, were not encouraging. When your paper loses $25 million over something less than three years, that, those are big numbers, and uh, uh, the people who sit on the board of directors have no particular ties to Buffalo. They were just... Uh, bottom line figures to them. For anybody to imply that they didn't give it the best shot, I think is uh, unwarranted and not really understanding the situation well. Uh, I don't think very many people would have done what they have done. Uh, if you were only looking at the bottom line and the hard numbers, they wouldn't have done what they, would, they had done. They were really trying to create a quality newspaper here in Buffalo. And who knows, if things could have changed and it might have been different, but uh, they gave it a very, very strong effort. We were fortunate as a city to have still maintained two competitive newspapers through all these years. All we have to do is go back and look at our census figures and track our census figures and see the declining population. Then we came into the cataclysmic area last year of losing major, major retailers. Retailers that spent millions of dollars every year in newspaper advertising. Advertisers are the lifeblood of a newspaper. They provide between 70 to 75 percent of your total revenues. And when you get that decline, and then you get the declining number of people who are potential customers for your newspaper, there's we. That's the crux of the whole thing. In the 1979 purchase from the Connors family, Coles Media also acquired Courier Cable, now called CableScope. CableScope's management and operations have been completely separate from those of the Courier Express since 1979 and will not be affected by the close down of the newspaper. I think that they now have uh, primarily what they came in here to uh, obtain, CableScope. And you can see why, stepping back from it and looking at the overall national picture, what's growing and what's not. Cable is the, is the way of the future. Uh, newspapers. Uh, have not been that way. And um, uh, it was a package deal. Three years later, they do not have the paper. Uh, they do have a tax write-off, and they also have cable scope. Bull feathers. Uh, that's just, there's just nothing to that. I have to tell you, uh, and I get a little riled up when I hear about it, we wouldn't have been busting our butts and putting this kind of money in here for three years if they just wanted to uh, keep the cable. As a matter of fact, I went to the board when I finally got in and looked at the numbers and said, here's the plan, here's what we think we can do. 
tell me now if you don't want to uh, play. I mean, uh, if you don't want to play, let's pull the plug and either sell it or close it right now and not go down this path and hire all these people and do all these kinds of things and try and make it a, a good paper. Let's, let's say it up front. And uh, they said, no, we want to do it. And, and quite frankly, what they really wanted to do was build a newspaper. And the cable came along with it. It was very nice that there's cable. It's a, it, 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 it's, a, it's a very good cable system, and it's a nice plus. But I have to tell you that what they really are interested in is newspapers. Roger Parkinson has uh, told me that uh, I, I'm not correct when I say that uh, uh, they wanted just cable scope. And I'd like to believe that. But uh, I, just, I just happen to believe that uh, they, they now have what, in their long-range view, is uh, what they really wanted, and, the, and that's the cable. What do you think of a one-newspaper town now? Oh, it's never good. It's never good. It's never good to have only one... One, one view? One view, and uh, the people will suffer from having one newspaper. And so will the advertisers. The rates will go up. I can guarantee you that Buffalo Evening News advertising rates will go up in a very short time. And uh, no, no one's better off with one newspaper. Certainly, we have enormous additional costs. Uh, newsprint, as you know, is so expensive. People are so expensive. We're using up a tremendous amount of additional newsprint and absorbing a lot of new people. Uh, advertising rates are predicated upon the cost per thousand, number of people who are seeing the ads that the advertisers are taking. Uh, yes, advertising rates will be adjusted. What will this do to the uh, political candidate looking for ink? Well, he'll have one outlet uh, as far as print journalism goes now, and that'll be the news. And uh, the, the news is in a would be in a very commanding position because, as I'm sure you know, Fran, um, uh, frequently in politics, uh, each uh, each paper has its own particular sources. And uh, of course, uh, the courier sources now will have to go down the streets of the Buffalo News. Uh, so uh, the news, of course, is in the, in the catbird seat as far as uh, that's concerned. But again, they've always been a responsible paper, and I'm sure they'll continue to be. Does a one paper city lose half its vision? Uh, hopefully not. And I would say that we are going to bend every effort to make sure that does not happen. We went out and immediately purchased a lot of the syndicated columnists that the Courier was carrying, Jack Anderson, Evans and Nowak, Carl Rowan, uh, Bill Buckley. Uh, and if you look at those, you'll see that some are liberal viewpoints and some are conservative viewpoints. Our own uh, syndicated writers that we had for years, also we try to strike that balance. Competition from television and radio, the growth of suburban newspapers, enormous operating costs. Economic issues ultimately bring newspapers down. But other factors precede the red ink, the same factors that separate great papers from the mediocre. Thomas Vail is the publisher and editor of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Ohio's largest paper, and winner in the survival battle with the Cleveland Press. They became less aggressive in the pursuit of the basic stories of the community and less aggressive in uh, promoting uh, the fine issues and, and candidates and whatever it is that a community has to have. You, you have to aggressively participate in the, uh, in, in the things of the community and try to make them happen. And I think that my, our competitor uh, stopped doing that. We are a news medium more than ever because with the coming of television, we are less an entertainment medium and we are more a news medium than ever before. So to maintain a high position in the community, you have to have integrity. You have to have a superior local news staff. Without it, you're in trouble. If any area thrives on the media, it's Washington. Yet the Washington Star's daily press run of 325,000 papers was not enough to keep it afloat. The disappearance of the Star and Afternoon paper briefly left the nation's capital with a single daily paper, the Washington Post. But unlike other markets, the Post quickly had new competition on the newsstands. The Washington Post was a monopoly newspaper for 20 minutes. Then the Mooney paper started up, and now USA Today has a, an edition here, and uh, they're selling copies here. So, uh, and and um, the, there is a ring of suburban papers. The journal papers here went daily. So um, I think if you, if you put the journal papers going daily, plus USA Today, plus the Mooney paper, 
you would probably get a circulation comparable to what the Star had when it uh, folded. It's always a good newspaper. And I, I don't know about that. That's an exception. The Herald Tribune was a good newspaper. But uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Most good newspapers with good, active local management don't fail. There were four newspapers, and the Star had uh, more than half the advertising. It had much more than half the advertising revenue. It had more circulation than anybody else. So, um, and, the, and the Washington Post was, uh, at one point, was fourth. You blame it strictly on the economy? No, I blame it on bad management, that particular one. Now, the economy uh, doesn't make it easy now, and, and inflation makes it awful tough. Uh, newspapers don't make a hell of a lot of money. In Philadelphia, nearly everybody reads the bulletin. That was the motto of what was once the largest evening paper in the country. When the bulletin went down, it still had a daily circulation of over 400,000. Not enough to survive against the Enquirer and the Daily News. Morning and afternoon papers owned by the Knight Ritter chain. The bulletin's revenue was approximately flat, about the same, for six years, the last six years of its existence. Uh, you can't cut cost enough to compensate for that. If you can't generate more revenue, then you simply aren't going to make it. And there is not enough revenue in cities of this size, or almost any size, to provide enough, uh, enough revenue to cover the overhead. There is nothing static in, in the American economy, whether it is newspapers, automobiles, the steel industry, or anything else, and there will be tremendous developments in your industry in the next few years as you go into, into a proliferation of sources of television uh, availabilities through cable and through the low power stations and through the U stations and the V stations. There is going to be a, a, a massive proliferation. Uh, as this happens, it is, it is uh, uh, 20 years from now, uh, people might well wonder, well, uh, what happened to all those television stations? And uh, are all of them going to be profitable? Can all of them stay in business? What happens when a two-paper town suddenly becomes a one-paper town? This poses a tremendous burden on the survivor. If the other paper was more liberal or more conservative than you were, perhaps you feel they were filling a void. Today, you've got to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to have their say, so that nobody feels that you're smug, complacent, uh, ornery. Uh, you don't want to have people feel that you're thrusting a point of view down their throat. I, I think that would be a terrible mistake. My worry about being a monopoly paper is that uh, the owners and the editors will get so scared of being accused of, uh, of being uh, dictatorial that they will bland out, that they will take no positive stand, and uh, that uh, for every editorial on one side, they'll have an editorial on the other side, so that there will be, uh, there'll be a lot of heat on the page, but no, no light, no real light. And uh, I hope that doesn't happen, but I can see that as the great danger. Being the only game in town, it, uh, it would seem feasible that you would raise your advertising rates or subscription price? Well, this is a, a question that has been much misunderstood. What the plane dealer did when the press went out of business, we actually uh, have, in a way, we have lowered our rates. Our circulation went up 20%. We raised our rates only 18%. So on a cost per thousand, or the cost for the advertiser to deliver their message to X number of people, it's cheaper for them now than it was before. So what we call a mill line rate, you can call it a cost per thousand, we have raised the rates less than the increase in our circulation. What must newspapers do today to survive? Well, in the, in the, uh, in the big cities, some of the newspapers that uh, uh, have died in recent years uh, I think couldn't have been saved. Uh, there will probably be more, more uh, fatalities in the future. There are some papers in, in some big cities that are in very much trouble right now, and it's very doubtful that they can be saved. Uh, society has changed its habits. Um, it's not a stay-at-home-in-the-evening society much anymore. Uh, those are the things that have made the big difference. Television is a major part of that. And television does something that we can't do, and that is it can give you instant coverage, it can give you sight, sound, color, all of the things that do nothing but whet the appetite of readers. 
When there's a big news break that you people cover instantly, our sales go up the next day. We've got to change with the times. Uh, we just can't be hidebound, and I don't think newspapers today are hidebound. You know, I remember very well back when I started in this business, editors made changes very, very gingerly. Even to change a comic was a major, cataclysmic type of decision. Now you roll with the punches. I think it would be nice to think that any major city could afford two excellent newspapers. But I don't think it does any good to have one strong newspaper and one weak one, because the weak one becomes more irresponsible. They have more and more problems financially. They cut the staff. It's very expensive to do a fine quality job. And I think that there is, I'll go a little farther. I don't think there's any city in the world that can afford two first class newspapers. I can't help but believe that uh, that uh, television can't do it. You, you, you can't Xerox television. You can't, uh, you, you run a, an experiment someday and, and take the seven o'clock news and then ask, uh, listen to it, and then ask some of your less uh, uh, professionally uh, newspaper oriented friends, uh, <clears throat> you know, what I'd rather say, what country was he talking about in, in Latin America? The average uh, uh, news item on the CBS Evening News will be uh, 150 words. That's two graphs. <clears throat> and uh, graphics fade. A newspaper you can pick up and look at and say, I don't understand that. I'm going to try it again. You've got to be useful. There's a great competition for, uh, for the time of a reader. And if you're not useful, if you're not fulfilling a need, uh, people will say, what the hell? I'll quit that and do something that uh, does, is useful to me. There's no obituary for the newspapers, apparently. I'm They're not going to write it. I've written a lot of obits, but I don't intend to write that one.